All right, welcome everybody. Um, training today. Stephen Wicks is our trainer. And I'm going to pass it over to him now. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave it in the question window. I'm going to pass it over to you, Stephen. Okay, so can you see the uh, presentation okay? Yes. All right, thank you. Good. All right. So um, welcome. Um, my name is Stephen Wicks. Uh, I am a senior data scientist at one of the uh, service companies commonly working with uh, the Transmart Foundation. Um, it's Clarivate Analytics. Um, I want to give you, uh, before I get started on the topic, just a quick introduction to Clarivate uh, for those of you who uh, may not have heard of us uh, since the company's only been around for about a year. Um, but the people and the organization uh, has been around much, much, much longer. Uh, we've been around since the early aughts. Originally, the team, which largely works sort of as a unit in Clarivate, started as a company called Gingo, um, which was acquired by Thomson Reuters, uh, I think around 2008. And so um, Gingo became a significant part of the life science um, division of uh, the holding company, Thomson Reuters, which also does a lot of work in other areas. So you may have heard of Thomson Reuters from, um, uh, if, if you've done any work in the legal profession, Westlaw, for example, is one of their products, or, or in finance and risk markets, or in governance. Uh, but they also had a fairly significant um, life science arm, which uh, by the end of 2015 was around 5,500 people globally. Um, so we were an uh, international um, uh, life science service organization. Uh, we also produce a number of, produced a number of products, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but in addition to, um, well, so what happened was at the uh, sometime during 2016, Thomson Reuters decided that they wanted to focus on finance and governance since they sold off their entire portfolio in the life science area. And that was acquired by a, a private equity firm and, and they spun out Clarivate Analytics as an independent company. So we're the entire life science portfolio from Thomson Reuters, um, now operating under the name Clarivate. Um, it includes um, a significant service component which is uh, shown, we have basically three uh, uh, branches of our, uh, of our service. Uh, we do uh, analytics uh, for a variety of markets, uh, usually omics data analysis, where we do, for example, mechanism reconstruction or patient stratification um, analysis for complex data sets. Uh, we do translational data research management. Um, this is the area I work in mostly. This is clinical and omics data management, um, Transmart services. Although we also do, um, we're platform agnostic. So I put Transmart services on this slide because of the nature of, of this talk, but we work with a variety of platforms and um, including um, the development of, of bespoke platforms uh, for data management for, for various client bases. Um, and yeah, custom infrastructure development. And then finally, we do um, quite a lot of work in um, pathway reconstruction, text mining, um, knowledge management vis-a-vis -vis the application of ontologies, for example, um, to complex data sets allowing, we do a lot of natural language processing and classification of terms into ontologies to allow sort of cross-concept mappings. And so we call this our data integration arm as well. Okay, so that's who we are. Um, we've been working with Transmart since the product w hit the um, hit the market as an open source uh, code base in 2012, um, and so we've we've have we have quite a bit of experience uh, working with Transmart. Okay, so today I want to talk about data representation issues um, and. This is a, I guess, an advanced topic in, in 
in Transmart because I'm not going to be walking through the interface in great detail. I'm not going to be giving uh, sort of a beginner's guide or an introduction um, to data loading. Uh, both of those topics have been covered several times this year in previous sessions. But if you are working with real data, then this is, I think, a really essential um, uh, area of knowledge with which I think gets underserved and isn't talked about enough. And that's how you choose to represent data because real data can be represented in multiple ways in Transmart. And each way has a sort of locus of advantage, advantages and a locus of disadvantages. And it really is a, a matter of balancing those. It's a zero sum game and you can't um, present data in a universally acceptable form. So really the take home lesson, if I were to tell you the punchline now, is that when you're loading data, what you need to do is to talk to the stakeholders and understand how they want to use the data once it's in Transmart. Because that will guide you to very, very different representations depending on use case. All right, and so I'm going to talk about three specific examples. Um, the first is uh, multifaceted clinical data. And um, what do I mean by this? So some clinical data is very simple, like demographics, for example. Um, you know, somebody has a uh, an age, uh, somebody has a, a gender, uh, ethnicity, race, etc. And so those can be loaded more or less the same way in all um, data sets. Uh, things can get a little more interesting when you're working with preclinical data because then you've got, you know, other variables. Um, you're, you may be working with non-humans. You may be working with mice or uh, monkeys. And so you've got a, uh, maybe even cross-species concepts that you need to consider. But for most, most of the data that we work with that's human data, you know, demographics are very straightforward. On, on the other extreme, um, you can have data that can be very, very complex. And an example that I'm going to use in this discussion is adverse event data from clinical trials. Um, I'll go into more detail about what that looks like in a couple of minutes. And by the end of the talk, you'll be sick of looking at adverse event data, I suspect. Um, the, the second example has to do with how we deal with cross-trial concepts. Um, there are a couple of different ways to do this in Transmart. Uh, there is a, a um, a way which was sort of built into the infrastructure that I'm not going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about is how you can use um, data representation to deal with problems with uh, cross-trial con uh, concept comparisons. And then finally, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, omics data and in particular, oops, Okay, excuse me, Java's getting in my way here. There we go. Um, uh, omics data in, from complex trial design. Um, many of, if you've loaded data in Transmart and you've, you've loaded, for example, gene expression data sets, and you've had occasion to do that from either um, a trial where data was collected from multiple tissues or in a longitudinal trial where gene expression data was, was captured from different visits, you've probably encountered one of your stakeholders coming to you with this question, which is, you know, you've shown me, you, I, I gave you one gene expression data set, and when you loaded it into Transmart, it broke it into three data sets based on visit. So visit one, visit two, and visit three. And I want really to do a, a marker selection workflow where I compare, you know, genes that are up or down regulated in visit three compared to visit one, right? How do I do that? I can't do that with this data and I'll show you how you can represent the data to solve that problem for, for people. And again, you'll get a, a more detailed look at that in a moment. So for this talk, um, I'm talking about the, uh, the, the Transmart instance as it exists in the wild today. That's a 16.2 version of Transmart. Um, much of what I'm going to talk about will be dealt quite differently, uh, will be dealt with quite differently once 17.1 uh, comes out and is public, uh, but that may be, you know, so anywhere from six to 12 months out still. So uh, for now we're working with 16.2. And the ETL, some of these questions of data representation are fairly tied to the ETL that you choose to use. Um, there are at least three widely used ETLs. Um, uh, the Hive is developing batch, uh, their batch loader, 
Um, the kettle scripts that were originally distributed with Transmart are still in use in some places. And um, TM Data Loader is the data loader that uh, Thomson Reuters uh, started developing in 2013. And um, this is what we use exclusively here at Clarivate, or almost exclusively. And um, um, many of our clients are very happy with it as well. So I'll be using TM Data Loader. Um, and we will be looking at mapping files and data files. So how data is represented in the mapping file is closely tied to the data loader. Okay. So Transmart, here's the sort of the workflow, right? We, you start with you as a, a data management scientist are presented with a variety of data types. In a, from a variety of different source files. They may be Excel files, they may be SAS files, they may be uh, flat text files, they may be PDFs that are scanned from physician's notes, you know, electronic health records or something like that. And so there's this process of curation. And there's also on the technical side, there's a process we call ETL. And these two things, these two processes really overlap conceptually. For some people, curation means making a data model which can be represented in some platform. And for other people, curation means data transformation and concept harmonization. On the other side, we have ETL, which stands for extract, transform, and load. And really what this blue arrow here is showing you is the load step of ETL. It's taking structured data that has been curated and pushing it into some underlying database. And the, ET, the E and the T here, the extract and the transform, really refer to this process of curation, where we're pulling data out of disparate sources, we're transforming it into a format that is um, ETL tool compliant. So in this case, TM data loader compliant. And that format is very brittle and very structured and not very tolerant to, um, and not very tolerant of, of misrepresentation of data structure. Typically, if you have data files that are not properly structured and you try to load them through an ETL tool, you'll get some sort of error that'll tell you that your data files are, are not compliant with the tool you're using. Um, but in reality, the curation process and the ETL process are really one and the same. Um, it's just convenient to break it down into uh, two steps uh, conceptually, where you, you have a data source and you have a data sync, and in between you need to create uh, a data file which is compliant with uh, insertion into the data sync. Okay. Now, the ETL tool in, um, that we're using, TM Data Loader, requires files to um, be structured in a certain way and also have um, uh, spatial relationships in terms of uh, the, file uh, the, the way the files are organized. Um, this is a typical study uh, for uh, insertion into Transmart. Um, and what you'll see is that uh, the study folder will contain uh, one or more subfolders, and the number of subfolders is related to the number of different data types that you're going to load. And so um, in this case, each subfolder will have a mapping file, which maps concepts from the data file to the tree in Transmart. Okay, so that's, um, that's it's sort of a, the tree in Transmart can be thought of sort of as a, a knowledge structure or even an ontology. It's a set of relation, um, uh, hierarchical relationships. And where in the tree data gets mapped is defined in the, the mapping file. Now, the structure of the mapping file for clinical data is slightly different than the structure of the mapping file for high dimensional data. That's kind of a trivial difference as far as this talk's concerned. Um, uh, but, um, you know, the number of columns and the way the columns are labeled are very, uh, very important. You can, there's not a lot of uh, flexibility there. In addition to the mapping files, uh, there is a platform file um, in the high, associated with the high dimensional data. Um, this, for example, in the context of a gene expression data set, the platform file maps probes to genes, right? So it maps individual cells in a, a matrix, which is, um, consists of probes going down the, uh, in a, you know, all the different rows are labeled with a probe name and the samples, which are column names, so that 
every cell in that spreadsheet consists of the intersection of a probe within a sample and it contains a, a an expression value a, a, a numeric value related to the degree of expression and the, the platform file tells you what that probe maps to um, you, the platform file can contain lots of information um, but the essential cells uh, are the gene name, the gene title, and the uh, uh, gene ID. Usually we use uh, entree gene IDs. Um, this works well for um, gene expression data that's kind of older. Uh, more sophisticated platforms, for example, the Clarium platform, um, which do things like have probes that bridge exon boundaries to detect various um, uh, splice alternates. Uh, there's a lot of information in those gene expression files which doesn't map nicely to gene name, okay? So um, conceptually, the gene name becomes unimportant and what becomes important is this, the transcript identifier because each transcript of a given gene that has multiple splice forms can be expressed at different levels. And it's really the sum of all of those transcript levels or the average, some conceptual average of all those different levels of expression of the various transcripts which map to a, a gene name. Um, so that's a, a kind of a, uh, a quirk in gene expression data representation, which we're still um, um, developing functionality for in platforms like Transmart. And then the remaining files that are not circled here are the various data files. Now there's always one uh, high dimensional data set within one of these folders, or actually you can have multiple ones uh, that would map to different parts of the tree. And you can have one or more, you need to have one or more uh, clinical data files as well. Um, right, so for example, here is a demographics file. The, the names of the data files are, are, are arbitrary. Um, they're not important, but those names do uh, become important when you put them into the mapping file. Okay, so let's take a look at our first example of complex data. This is um, uh, adverse event data from clinical drug trials, okay. So clinical drug, drug trials can contain quite a wide variety of data types. Um, some of them are relatively easy to deal with as a curator. Uh, for example, laboratory measurements, we almost always load those the exact same way. Um, these are things like, um, um, you know, blood panel results and clinical chemistry results. They're usually numeric and sometimes non-numeric values associated with a test. And that test can be classified in some way, for example, uh, clinical blood chemistry uh, from serum, or clinical blood chem or clinical chemistry from urine, for example. So you can you can organize a knowledge hierarchy pretty easily around concepts like laboratory results. Um, adverse event data, though, is multifaceted. So there are lots of different ways to talk about adverse event data. So if you do a clinical drug trial, you know one very important um, 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 sort of thematic area in uh, associated with adverse event data is the body system that's affected. So, you know, neurological events and cardiovascular events and gastrointestinal events may be seen very differently by different companies depending on the nature and mechanism of action of the drug. If it's a drug affecting the central nervous system and you start getting a lot of neurological events, then that can, that can be a big red flag, you know, in progressing your trial to uh, say phase two. Similarly, severity is very important when you're doing clinical drug trials, you need to report severe adverse events and there's a whole um, sort of data reporting cascade that gets triggered by flags that are um, considered severe. Uh, relation to experimental indication, um, uh, uh, action, so what action was taken when an adverse event was noted? Was there a change in dosing schedule? Was, um, was the person removed from the trial? Uh, um, was there, uh, you know, just continued observation of that, um, of that uh, symptom or that, that uh, adverse event um, in subsequent visits, for example? Um, whether or not the uh, event was perhaps related to the d disease of interest, you know. Um, another one is status. Is the event uh, ongoing at the next visit or is it now inactive? Is this something that happened between visits? Was it transient or acute? Or is it a potentially a chronic symptom that needs to be monitored going into the future? And then finally, something like health risk. Um, uh, even, you know, something like uh, cardiovascular events 
Um, shortness of breath or palpitations could be considered minor or severe depending on the intensity, but both of, both of which are associated with significant health risk because they're predictors of potential uh, more significant cardiac events. So we're gonna look at some data in Transmart, and I'm going to show you um, three different ways that we've loaded the same data set, uh, sort of as a, an example of how uh, you can look at this data. Okay, where's my browser? All right, uh, let me reload this. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to compare this medical history tree in this strangely named data D no ord to uh, this data study medical history one. Um, I'll do this one first. So in both cases, you can see that there are 599 subjects that have medical history data. So it's the same data set. Uh, in both cases, I've, I've placed the adverse events hierarchy under medical history, and I'm going to open, um, yeah, I'll open this one first. Okay, so when I open this, it's immediately clear what's going on. I've organized the data by body system and organ class, okay, so, the, so that we can easily distinguish neurological events from cardiovascular events, right? So there were 127 psychiatric uh, people with psychiatric adverse events. There were 59 people with dermatologic uh, adverse events. But let's dig down a little bit deeper. Let's pick one of these hierarchies. Um, neurological is always interesting. Okay, this is a longitudinal study. So you can see there were a vari variety of visits, including some unscheduled visits where people may have had to, you know, go to the emergency room for symptoms that may have been significant or they may have had an unscheduled um, uh, uh, meeting with their general practitioner who did a physical and noted some information which was then passed on to the clinical trial operator, uh, as well as a variety of um, uh, scheduled events, uh, you know, on uh, baseline and one, three, six month visits, et cetera. Uh, let's open up one of these, uh, let's look at six months out. Okay, and here, remember, we're diving down through the neurological cascade. I have the rest of the data um, sort of organized in a flat way beneath the body system and organ class. So if I open another node, say musculoskeletal, uh, one month, you'll see the same concepts, right? Action, health risk, relation to experimental medication, relation to non-experimental medication, Parkinson's disease, severity, status, and year of onset. Those are exactly the same as the ones that I've got down here. Close this up to keep things a little neater, okay. And then, um, for example, if you wanted to find out how many people had a severe uh, neurological event, you can immediately just drill down, okay. And you can see that, uh, at the six month visit, there were uh, eight people with severe um, neurological adverse events in this, in, this, uh, in this study. And you can see here they are. There were uh, two occasions where people had seizures. There were three serious headaches, drowsiness, confusion, and altered taste. And um, if you wanna make a cohort of those, that's pretty easy to do. These are neurological severe adverse events. Now, in contrast, I wanna go look at the second cascade up here from this other study. And um, here I'm looking at medical history, adverse events, and when I open this, immediately you notice a significant difference. So in this case, I can further dig into the body system and organ class. I have that option here in the hierarchy, so all 599 uh, individuals have their um, adverse events indexed by organ class, as they are in this first medical history. But what you'll see is that whereas in our original study, each adverse event was deposited once in a knowledge structure, in this case, we've redundantly indexed the same data 
by each system of classification. So one, two, three, four, six, seven, so eight different ways to look at the same data. And, and that turns out to be significant for clients because, um, uh, because you know, different stakeholders in the data may be interested in different aspects of the data, right? The, clinic, the, the clinician, for example, may be interested in um, health risk, whereas the um, person behind the drug trial who's, whose area of specialization is the development of this particular medication may be interested in the relationship to experimental medications. Now, all the data is available in both trees, but for example, if you want to get information about relationship to experimental medication, regardless of body system or organ class, that's hard to do in the second um, hierarchy, right? You have to dig through all these folders to find each of these, um, you know, deeply nested concepts about ex relation to experimental medication. And if you wanted to make a cohort of all the people who had um, symptoms that were definitely related to the experimental medication, regardless of visit, you'd be digging through folders for quite some time because um, you need to you drill down through each visit um, into the non-experimental med medication folder and then, you know, pull that, pull that one subject out of this folder and, uh, and here at one month relationship to experimental medication again. Um, Okay, there's none that are definitely related there, but you to verify to validate this or to verify, you need to dig through all these folders uh, and generate a very complex cohort. On the other hand, if you just want to find the people who have definitely related symptoms, it's easy to do. Regardless of body system or organ class, there are two, right? And I can pull that out of here and I can get some summary statistics on those. And if I want to know what body system or organ class it is there. Um, so there were several different uh, body systems and organ classes. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's the first take home is the sort of naive way to load the data is to decide on the knowledge structure and load it one way. What we typically do now um, here at Clarivate is we end up loading uh, concept trees like uh, adverse events in multiple ways. Um, and usually, so this is a very general way to do it uh, because we've loaded it all possible way. Well, not all possible ways. This is the next thing I'm going to talk about, but we've loaded it in a variety of different ways where top level concepts are relatively easy to create cohorts from. Okay, now let's come back down um, to our original study. Right, so actually let me, let me show you conceptually um, what this uh, looks like, okay, the differences in data representation in these two models. Um, the one we looked at first, uh, medical history in the data study. So this is the one where um, the data is loaded immediately by uh, body system and organ class, and then you would drill down through that to um, where you find all of the sub um, subclasses of data indexed. By the way, um, the way that I've done this where I've loaded by body system and organ class, in this case it wasn't arbitrary, it was because the client had a particular interest in the body system and organ class and that's the way they wanted the data loaded. Um, I could have, however, under adverse events immediately loaded the visit name and then placed a folder down here called body system and organ class where all nine of these concepts would have been available as separate folders within each visit. That's also uh, um, a, a way to, to, to have loaded this data. Okay. Right, so the medical history. Uh, to get a, a concept like all neurological events, that's pretty easy to do, um, right? We can make a, can take all the neurological events. Actually, let's just, to make it a little, simpler, let's pick one, one visit, let's pick visit 
uh, the one month visit. And what we want to do is is find all of the neurological events that are severe. Okay. And um, you can see that we can drill down here. So here's the neurological events. We can look in one month. And here's the severity locus. And, and yeah, so it's pretty simple. There are seven neurological events that are severe. Um, now, if we go up, and so that's uh, conceptually, this is what we're doing. We're, we're looking at neurological events, and then we're looking at the severity locus, and we're selecting um, the level of severe, which, which has seven observations. Now, if we try to do the same thing up here, if we look in body system and organ class, here are neurological events. If I open this, I immediately get to the symptom codes. And the problem is some of these are going to be, you know, neurological like that one happens to be, but some of them are going to be um, uh, you know, motor or uh, this is a musculoskeletal or slurred speech. Oh no, these are all neurological. So, but, but we don't have any indication of severity here. Some of these are going to be severe, some are going to be um, mild, moderate, or perhaps not reported, I think is also possible. Uh, level of reporting. So I can make I can make a, a set of neuro, I can look at the neurological events from visit one or from the one month visit. Okay. So there they are. There are 125 of those. And then I can ask about severity separately. And I can say, okay, show me all the uh, the um, neurological events from that visit, which uh, which were severe. And that's this set. And we can look at the intersection of those two things. All right, there are 11 um, people who had neurological events and also had severe events. Why is that different from seven? So what's going on here? Well, because of the way we loaded the data, it wasn't nested. This data was loaded all, uh, all body system and organ class events for neurological are loaded here, and all events that are severe are loaded in a separate tree. And there are some severe events which are going to be cardiovascular, and there are some severe events that are going to be uh, musculoskeletal or genital, genital, uh, genital urinary, right? So you're going to end up with a larger subset of people. And so what we're actually doing when we do this uh, intersection of neurological events and severity looks something like this. We're taking two, we're taking the and union of two sets and we end up with a larger number than we do when we nest the data. Now it is possible to identify which of these 11 events are, neuro, are, are um, severe and neurological by fiddling around in grid view and dragging various concepts in um, but it can take quite a, oops, oh yes, you know, here are all the events. But it can take quite a bit of time um, to do that. Here are the severe uh, neurological events. These are severe events, and these are both um, neurological. So uh, if your goal is to find, you know, if the, 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 the uh, stakeholder comes to you and said, we need to be able to identify severe neurological events or severe cardiovascular events, then you want to use um, this sort of uh, data structure, okay, where you nest severity beneath each of the uh, body system and organ class concepts, right? So severity is nested down here. But keep in mind, the person may come to you and say, you know, we're interested in severe cardiovascular, we're interested in severe, event, uh, all severe events, and we want to be able to break that down by body system and organ class. Then you would reverse this. You would, you'd bring severity up a level and you drop the body system and organ class hierarchy down a level. Now let's take a look at how the data is structured in these two files. Um, okay. So first, let me bring a mapping file in. Um, okay. Let me just see here. So 
the hierarchy I've been talking about is represented by this part of this hierarchy. All right, so here we have, uh, here, let me bring, there we go. Uh, okay, so we have file name, the category code, column number, data label, and data label source. In this case, uh, we're loading the data um, in such a way that data label source is not used. Um, we have the study ID, uh, subject ID, and visit name. The visit name is a, should be, there we go. The visit name, and in this case, the uh, body system and organ class, which I've just labeled as um, the word organ. Let me bring in the data file for this. Here it comes. Okay. Right, so again, subject ID, study ID, subject ID, visit name, and um, the body system and organ class. And, and the way this file is organized, uh, we have, um, make this a little bigger, there we go. There we go. Okay, we have uh, subject is represented multiple times because there are multiple visits. Um, but you'll notice that uh, even for each visit, you can have multiple different um, uh, symptoms. So the symptoms over here on the right, make this uh, more visible. I don't know if this is going to be visible or not. There we go. Let's hide these for a second. There we go. Okay, so we have two different um, symptoms for one subject at one visit. One of them is neurological, one's cardiovascular. And um, you can load categorical data this way where you uh, have multiple rows per subject per visit. And um, it, if the data is loaded into different concepts, it's, it's not a problem. If you try to load neural, uh, numeric data this way, it, it can be problematic. You need to introduce um, another variable, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is uh, like an ordinal variable that separates, you know, uh, you would have an ordinal variable that referred to altered taste as the first um, uh, ad reported adverse event and the palpitations as the second adverse uh, reported adverse event. Um, so you'd need to be able to distinguish different rows uh, from each other in terms of the, the path, because you can only load one numeric value into the terminal leaf node of the transmart tree, but you can load multiple uh, categorical values into the terminal load node of a transmart tree. They become different levels of a categorical variable. Right? Now, in this case, we don't load directly from this column symptom. What we've done is represented the data, uh, for example, the, uh, um, this, this uh, well, where is it, action. Okay, here's our first uh, column, our first data column. So this is a variable action, and these are the actions that were observed, that were undertaken for each of these neurological events. But rather than load directly from here, uh, what we've done is transpose this data into a series of different variables. Okay, so uh, observe, not reported, discontinuation of experimental medication, change in dosing schedule, reduction in dosage, uh, disclosure of treatment condition. So these are the potential actions. And then uh, we've mapped those actions from here for each um, uh, uh, Right, so altered taste, the action was observed. I've just transposed it so that observed becomes a variable and altered taste sits there. Uh, whereas for um, uh, this individual also has an altered taste uh, um, adverse event, but this one was not reported rather than observed. So it sits in this position here. And so when we represent the data this way, this becomes uh, the six levels of the first variable these are the two levels of um, 
the action, uh, sorry, the uh, status, so whether the adverse event is active or inactive. Um, here we have four levels of uh, severity, mild, moderate, severe, and not reported. Here we have the uh, five levels of relation to experimental medication, et cetera, all the way through all the different variables. Okay, and so the net result of looking at this, just to bring this back, this was the mapping file. So again, here's the organ. Um, the organ is used as a data tag. So this notation here, the double dollar sign followed by the word organ, means that you're going to use the values that are found in the column organ in the data file as a variable which is interpolated into the path. Right, and so the net result then is that um, the body system and organ class becomes a node in the tree beneath which you can you can continue the path. Right, so after organ, we have visit name, and then in this case action. Right, so we have visit name, and then action. So this hierarchy with the values of not reported or observed is loaded uh, here from these two rows. Organ visit name action, right? And then we also have, uh, there, there were in this case, uh, no other uh, values or we would have had more um, subfolders nested under action. We could potentially have six because there's six distinct possible actions, right? Discontinuation, change in dosing schedule, etc. And if I look hard enough, um, I would find examples. Let me dig down a little bit. Uh, what are we in dermatologic? logic? Let's go to cardiovascular action. Here we go. Right. So here's three of the variables. So there were four cases where discontinuation of the drug was appropriate. Okay, let's contrast this data file and this mapping um, construct where, uh, again, we've split the variable into multiple uh, distinct variables um, based on the uh, value in that variable with what's going on up in this tree. Um, and here in this tree, uh, let's see. Right, so in this tree, we load the data flat across the top in many different ways. And then, um, you know, so if you're interested in uh, um, uh, adverse events that are related to the experimental medication. Okay, so uh, in this case, um, body system and organ class is is not part of the hierarchy. So you need to, use, to, to sort of do the intersection of body system and organ class with these decoded symptoms. So in the data file, it looks very different. That is uh, this one. Let me bring in the mapping file as well. All right. This is a complicated mapping file. So here we have, um, you know, again, the service variables. Uh, subject ID and study ID, and we also have visit name down here as a service variable. Um, and then instead of just body system and organ class, which we used in the last, um, which is called BSOC in this tree, but instead of just using this as a tag, we use all of the different um, domains of interest as tags. And let me show you the data. Um, again, the service variables are these uh, gray with yellow text, and then um, these are the ones that are used as tags, the action, status, severity, 
relation to non-experimental medication, relation to disease, health risk, and relation to experimental med medication. There are a number of dark orange columns here that I want you to ignore, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna hide these. Uh, they're not germane to loading. Uh, format column hide. Okay, and then we have the very the um, the decoded symptom code. So this is the the symptom that, and that's it for the data file, right? So we don't load the data. We don't split the symptoms into multiple levels across uh, columns. And um, what you'll notice is that there aren't very many columns, but in the data file, or sorry, in the mapping file that we're using, uh, there in the data file there are only 20 columns. Um, but I have many, many more um, uh, mappings here, and that's because what I'm doing is I'm mapping the same set of four rows multiple times. You'll see these numbers are uh, non-consecutive, so 16 through 20, and then another mapping of 16 through 20, and then another mapping of 16 through 20, etc. cetera. Um, and if you've been loading data, you probably don't see this done very often, but you can do this in a TM data loader. It'll load these columns. It'll give you a warning that these rows have been already mapped uh, once before when it tries to map them a second time, but it won't quit. It will continue to load the data. And so the net result is the same, the same um, set of data is loaded into multiple hierarchies. Okay, so this is the, the 599 individuals are loaded into action, and then they're also loaded into body system and organ class, and they're also loaded into health risk, et cetera. Okay. Oh, and then finally, uh, I want to draw your attention to a third hierarchy, which is, I think, probably closer to what we do for most clients. Um, these hierarchies are bespoke. So here we really you know, talk to the people who are gonna be using the data and we create hierarchies that are going to maximize their utility. And these can be sort of hybrid. Um, they can be arbitrarily, they tend to be uh, more of the drill down variety but the paths that we choose to create and make available to them um, are derived from our assessment of their needs. Okay, so uh, for example, body system and organ class first, followed by uh, severity, um, perhaps followed by relation to experimental medication. And that gets them to a very quick way to make the kind of cohort that a person working with this data routinely has to make as part of his or her reporting of um, you know, um, the results of the experiment. Um, right. So that, for example, is very different from here where we put the hierarchy by severity, we put severity at the top, and then we put um, action, so a discontinuation of experimentation. And then if they're interested, they can break it down by body system and organ class and a status. So here, here's a, uh, oh, and, and relation to experimental medication. So you can go arbitrarily deep depending on how refined you want the concept to, to be, okay? And so uh, what we have here are three different ways to load the data that I've shown you. Uh, in the first, we loaded each data multiple times in a sort of a flat structure, and cohorts tend to be intersectional where you're using high-level concepts and creating large intersections, sort of like what we have over here. Uh, in the second approach, um, the data, each datum is loaded only once in a, um, a, a strictly hierarchical tree uh, where each branch is exclusive. Uh, and so this data tends to be nested and cohorts are designed by drilling down through multiple levels to the desired level. And what I wanna emphasize is this third approach is similar, um, it's a hybrid of the two where the data can be loaded multiple times. So we can load multiple uh, bespoke trees that are arbitrarily nested or that are nested according to um, the fit, you know, to, to make the data fit for purpose. 
and tend to be drilled down as they are here. Okay, um, I do want to talk, that was probably the 80% of um, the presentation today. I know we're coming up on top of the hour, so I do want to talk briefly about these other two um, um, cases. In the second case, um, we want to talk a little bit about how we load um, uh, cross-trial concepts. Um, so if you consider a set of uh, four related drug trials, say you're a drug company and you've got a drug of interest and you've run um, uh, clinical trials in four different markets using slightly different formulations, but you want, and you want to do baseline comparisons across trials. Um, there is in Transmart a, uh, a node in the tree, it's always up here at the top, um, is this a cross trials node? And if you go to a, a sort of a demo instance, it's almost always like this, it doesn't open to any, end to anything. And that's because to use this, you need to create sort of a metadata file which maps concepts from different parts of different trees to a common concept, which can appear up in here. Um, I think most people who've tried to do that find it probably not worth the time to try and maintain because as you expand the number of trials that go into Transmart, it can become sort of unwieldy and difficult um, um, to keep this organized. Um, and the fact is often cross trial concepts are only interesting within the context of, of this sort of scenario where you have you know, a, a limited number of trials that you wanna compare concepts across. Um, so in this case, yeah, where you've got a drug form, maybe similar drug formulations in different markets. So let's take a look at what that looks like in Transmart, how we deal with that. Um, this is a, a case where this, we have four different trials that were loaded into one data tree. And the way you do this is basically uh, amalgamate all the data files into a single large data file and create a variable called study of origin where you, you, you um, uh, every observation is tied to a particular study and, and you load that variable into the clinical tree. So if, for example, somebody's interested in, um, you know, serum chemistry, uh, let's see, potassium levels, numeric values. Okay, we wanna look at, so all 622 people will make a, oops, clear this cohort. We wanna look at laboratory, measurements, but we're interested in only, you know, this is the typical approach usage of Transmart. The only thing we have to do differently uh, here is specify what study you're interested in looking at. And when you make your cohort, now you're looking at the uh, 297 individuals that were in study A, okay? But what, what you have the power to do is to look at, again, oops, all of the laboratory data, but you can compare the values of a particular concept from study A and study B. You can make two courts, one from each study, and you can compare baseline values, like just by dragging the variable in and dropping it. And so here are levels of uh, potassium in milliequivalents per liter from study A and study B. Uh, similarly, you know, if there are different uh, formulations of the drug of interest, you can load those as a, a high level uh, study factor called treatment, and you could use those to differentiate effects across trials. So this turns out to be quite a lot less, uh, um, uh, well, I would say more a more facile way to deal with cross-study concepts in organizations where you're, where you're interested in comparing studies across concepts, but only in very specific situations. If you really want to be able to compare um, you know, if you're in an organization that is always going to be measuring uh, diet, dietary uh, information, like, I don't know, lipid levels. Uh, well, actually, the nomenclature there is a bit weird, so let's look at minerals. So, you know, dietary source of potassium from various food sources. If you do that all the time, then this may be something that you want to use the cross-trial cons cons construct in Transmart to handle. But if you're really doing it, ever only across a limited number of trials, then loading the data this way makes a lot more sense. And then finally, um, very briefly, I wanna talk about how we handle gene expression data from complex trial design. Um, this is going to be the exact same study that I'm showing you, 
But in this case, uh, let me show you first what the biomarker data look like. Um, they, did, they did a small sort of pilot with some gene expression data from uh, 13 individuals. <clears throat> but what you may have noticed when we were looking at um, the clinical data was that uh, concept that this is a longitudinal um, um, experiment. So we have data from uh, week zero, and it turns out there's some data from week four and, and week eight. And when we look at the uh, gene expression data, we load that uh, into Transmart. Um, it splits the data file up by visit. Um, and that's fine. Uh, so we have you know three nodes here. And you can do all kinds of things with these three nodes. You can do analysis of variance, comparing uh, uh, levels from week zero to week eight. That's possible. But you know a very common workflow in Transmart uh, is is um, uh, marker selection, where you're asking a very general question from a high dimensional data set. You know, I, I'm interested in a ranked order of which probes in this data set change most under two conditions. And the way we organize that in uh, Transmart is you compare um, across study, for example, or across visit. And um, let's say across visit. So, so you, you create uh, two cohorts, um, and if I want to compare week zero to week eight and do a gene, ex like some sort of, you know, I don't know what you would do here. You could drag that in. Okay, so you've got, you've got, the same 13 individuals in in um, subset one and subset two, and you can do a marker selection. Uh, here, and you know, you drag this in, and you want to compare it to this. This does not work, right? It doesn't. It doesn't understand what to do with two high-dimensional data sets, um, and uh, so that's a problem. Um, what you really want to be able to do is is look at the effect of time. So time is is the variable that you want to break these down by. And actually, I have another. Well, I don't have another one loaded, but this also becomes a, an issue when you, for example, have gene expression data from different tissues. Like if you have um, uh, a tumor, say uh, uh, in the stomach cancer, you, it's not uncommon to take a tumor sample, so a tumor biopsy, and then a healthy biopsy from the same tissue that's non-tumorous, antrum or something like that. Or you may take, uh, for example, in ovarian cancer, you may take a biopsy from the healthy ovary and a biopsy on the contralateral side on the, uh, the ovary that doesn't have uh, any tumor progression, and you want to compare those two. Well, that's very difficult to do in Transmart because the data gets split by sample type. And you can organize the data differently such that that's not the case. And one way to do it is the way, uh, in the case of uh, longitudinal data, um, you'll notice this the same study loaded twice. One of them has 622 subjects, and the other has 661 subjects but it's the same data set. So what happened here? I'll just show you, and actually I'll, I'll make it a little easier by, uh, doo -doo. okay. And 661 and 622, uh, and they are from different studies, so there's no uh, overlap. But if you look at um, grid view, uh, and I'm going to sort by patient number. Okay, so here now we're looking at these, uh, the same patients from two different trials. And I'm going to scroll down and you'll see that it's nice sort of multi, uh, MS multi, multi, MS multi, all the way down to, to, through the various subjects until we get down here to the, high, to the subjects that have high dimensional data. And uh, then we have, um, uh, you know, this J3006 has three uh, samples, okay? And then that is from the multi-trial. 
and then we have the same subject, but now with a new subject ID, J3006V00, and that is just the first uh, sample. So what we've done is renamed, we've created pseudo subjects for, uh, we've taken J3006 and we've broken it into three subjects um, as associated with um, each of the three samples, uh, zero, two, and uh, on this, oh, here's eight, zero, two, four, and eight. So there are actually four samples in this case. And here's J3007 from one trial, and it's broken into four subjects, J007, uh, visit zero, visit two, visit four, visit eight. And that becomes part of the subject ID. So because there were 13, um, uh, high dimensional data nodes, subjects with high dimensional data rather, there are an additional 13 times three, uh, 26, 39 subjects. And that's the difference between six, uh, 622 and 661 is the 39 additional subjects. And uh, just um, what you have to do when you do that is not only make additional subjects in the high dimensional data set, but you have to create the subject these subjects throughout all of the clinical data as well. So that um, um, here in the MS multi, where this is MS stands for uh, marker selection, this data set is only usable, usable for marker selection kinds of measurements because uh, like if I look at demographic information, it's not longitudinal, it's relatively easy to look at. Um, you know, every subject has uh, uh, country of origin, sure, can drag that in. All right, so all of these subjects are Japanese. All right, so all of the, the, the all of the clinical data is loaded for all of the pseudo subjects in the uh, multi trial. But what that allows you to do, if you look at the biomarker data. Because you load pseudo subjects, you were able to amalgamate all of the three separate um, longitudinal data sets into a single data set. And now you can set up um, you can set up an analysis where you want to look at just the 39 subjects and you want to look at uh, you uh, load the study factor data. I've added a visit label level so I can compare visit zero with visit eight. So now I've created proper uh, um, cohorts that'll work here. And actually I've, I've just because this takes a while, I've loaded a, a gene list. So the marker selection goes pretty fast and you can do a marker selection that compares visit zero with visit eight. You know, and, and nothing is significant because these were randomly selected genes. But if I run this with the real data set, I'll find a number of, uh, um, a number of significant uh, genes that are di differentially expressed under these under this longitudinal state. And you can do the same thing that you could do in the previous data set. You can, you can do other comparisons that are not related to longitudinality, but you need to be aware that because you've created pseudo subjects in the uh, marker selection data set, uh, those pseudo subjects, um, that the statistical, the statistics are going to be off on those pseudo subjects because the N is artificial, right? So you don't want to do any uh, sort of exploratory statistics with this data node. This data node is created specifically to enable you to do, to do uh, uh, longitudinal marker selection analysis on high dimensional data. All right. Oops, okay. All right, so that's it. I think we're just a couple minutes over. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Uh, let's see, is this data set available? Um, 
Yeah, I don't think, so somebody has asked if the data set is available to download into your own instance. This is not, uh, I can't make this data set available, no. I'm not sure uh, this was Weibo uh, from the Hive. Um, but I could make a version of this data set, which, uh, you know, a reduced version of this data set, which could be loaded if you're interested. Maybe you could send me an email offline. I don't know if I can just uh, unmute everybody. Okay, another question. Um, what infrastructure do we need to build the system? To build Transmart? Yeah. Um, you can do it on your own hardware. Um, it is possible to do. Most of the installations that we do uh, are um, on Amazon Web Services, so we do cloud installations typically. Uh, some organizations prefer to do this on their own system. And I can, if you are interested, I can send you uh, specifications. We usually um, uh, use two uh, Amazon, two, two um, Elastic servers. We use a, an application server, which is typically spec for 25 or 50 gigabytes. Uh, I think it's an X4 large, uh, server, and then we use a second one for the database, which is spec for more storage. We load the app, uh, the ETL, and um, the uh, Transmart instance onto the smaller of the two, and we load the database onto the larger of the two. That's sort of a typical uh, construction. Um, what you need in addition to the hardware or a web, Elastic Web Space is um, is the Transmart uh, application, which you can get from uh, the uh, foundation GitHub, and the ETL, which is also available on GitHub. Um, and then some, there, there is some technology stack, Solar and Java and some other, other things. Uh, but the uh, Transmart Foundation has a wiki which uh, outlines installation it used to be pretty uh, pretty painful to install Transmart. It's actually gotten a lot easier in the last few years um, where you can install it on a virtual, uh, you know, there's there's a basically, you, it's all virtualized. If you've never done an installation like this before, I'd suggest you you talk to, uh, um, to we, we should talk about what's required because it's not, it's not completely trivial. Okay. Um, okay, the next question was, can you give our team a demo about Transmart since our team is trying to build the infrastructure? Uh, yes, um, if you're in, I mean, there's very different kinds of demos that can be done. Uh, on the technical side, we can do a demo on sort of installation and configuration, or we can work with your team, um, consult with your team on how to do that. <laughs> Or uh, alternately, um, if you're, uh, you know, there, there are basically two other or two other common demos that are what we often give. One is a user-oriented demo where once the installation is complete uh, and you have some data on it, we work with your people about how to navigate and how to how to utilize the various workflows that are enabled in Transmart, how to get the data out, um, and we also do um, uh, ETL. Uh, uh, consulting, basically, where we work with people on on your team, not only about building the um, building the system out, but how do you get data into it? You know, how do you go through? What does it look like to do the curation, and how do you use the ETL? So yeah, we can we can do all of that. Um, I'd be happy to uh, address questions. 
Um, I will put up my email address here if it isn't already somewhere else. So if you have any questions that uh, pertain to potential follow-on um, that we've discussed here, you can send me an email at this address. Let's see if there's anything else. Okay, fantastic. Um, so that's all the questions that have come in. I guess uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all around the Transmark community over the next uh, couple of years. Thank you, Stephen. We will have this recording up on the website uh, very soon. So thank you and have a great day. All right, cheers.